Okay, shot and then story, right? Yep, shot and story. Okay. Ready? Yep. Cheers. Cheers. I think I'm getting better at that. Me too. Practice, practice. I feel good. <laughs> All right, story. So I asked Stephen if we could tell this story. Stephen is our younger brother. He said yes. I don't know if he meant yes, but he said yes. So we're going to tell it. Uh, this is my favorite procrastination story. So this is a few years ago. He had just finished his AA degree and he was trying to figure out what to do with his life. So he, he needed a career and he had this idea to start a business. He wanted to start a powder coating business, which is uh, you cover a piece of metal in this powder. Basically, it almost magnets on there and then you bake it in this really hot oven uh, and it, it kind of fuses into the metal part and makes this super hard finish. Basically, it's this specialty thing that they use in automotive parts and stuff like that. Uh, so it's a it's kind of a big deal. It's not something you could just do easily. Uh, so he had this idea to start this business and he started working on it, started brainstorming, started building a workshop. Uh, he drove around the state trying to find the right oven, a specialty oven that can cook super hot. And uh, he bought a media blaster, all of this stuff. And he's out in the garage practicing media blasting, just working to perfect all of this, the techniques you need to do this thing. So lots and lots of work going into this. Uh, and I was talking with him about it and kind of helping him a little bit. And, you know, it, it was pretty exciting. He's creating this, this business. So it gets to the point where everything's pretty much done. He's got everything in place, got the ovens, has it all figured out. And it's becoming time to start actually getting business of calling people, trying to make actual things happen. Uh, and I, I hadn't seen him in a little while. Uh, he was living with mom and dad and I, I wasn't. So I drove over there expecting to witness the business coming to fruition. And I'm like, where's Steven? And so I go out in the backyard and mom and dad live on, you know, five acres, as you know, uh, and he was gardening. And when I say gardening, I don't, I don't mean like a window box. I mean, several hundred square feet of earth had been overturned and he is covered head to toe in dirt and sweat. I mean, this is the dead of summer heat and he is toiling away with a shovel and a hoe. And I mean, he's growing crops like corn and potatoes and turning the earth into this self-sufficient source of food. And he's leaning on his shovel and he's like, dude, check this out. I've been working on this for 10 or 12 hours every day on this, this garden. Like, look at it. Isn't this, a, isn't it awesome? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that that's awesome. I'm super impressed, but why are you doing that? And he looks at me and he goes, I don't know. <laughs> and that's my story. So I didn't, I didn't realize he had done the garden. Yeah, yeah, it was it was quite it was a garden to behold. It was actually amazing. But that's my favorite procrastination story. Why is that your favorite procrastination story? <laughs> well, because it's not me, for one, right. and it's nice to be able to talk about somebody else procrastinating. I have done that same thing a thousand times over, and I should say this. Steven is currently an engineer on a super yacht. He figured it out and he is extremely successful. Uh, so me talking about him do it, procrastinating something is fine because he's done extremely yeah, well for himself. Doing fine. If he yeah. was still struggling, then I don't think I would have told that story. I mean, he's not. But the reason why it's my favorite procrastination story is because it dispels a couple myths. The first one that drives me crazy is that people often think of procrastination as if it's just laziness. They'll talk about somebody procrastinating as if they're just being lazy. But lazy people do not toil away overturning the earth, growing crops in the middle of Florida heat. That's not what a lazy person does. And Steven, just in general, is one of the least lazy people that I've ever met. Uh, so that makes it interesting to me why you would procrastinate doing one of the hardest things I can think of to do with your free time. Uh, aggressively the, procrastinating right like angrily painfully procrastinating the other part that's interesting is that 
uh, it, it's interesting when it happened. He already put in a ton of work on the business. He did a lot of very difficult work. He was up, up late in the garage, you know, practicing, learning these techniques, doing hard labor. And it was at the end with the, okay, I need to call people where the procrastination kicked in. That to me is also very interesting. You know why I think it might be? It's because getting all the equipment and knowing how to do the job was probably a pretty clear path but as soon as he finished that and got to the business side of it which is much more vague mm -hmm. and not as clear um that's when it probably fell apart yes i because vagueness leads to <laughs> to that yes i think that is one of the key points of procrastinating uh, we we think about it as if procrastination is you being lazy avoiding doing something hard and the avoiding doing something hard i think is true but the word hard is not the right word because gardening like that is hard uh you know, building a workshop is hard calling people on the phone isn't hard exactly it doesn't hurt you it's not physically difficult oh my god it hurts me but it hurts in your soul not in yeah. your body that's right. the it kind of hard yeah. that i mean right i will go to extreme lengths to avoid phone calls i, I mean Be i think most hurts. of our generation hates them but yes that has that is on my list of things that i wanted to bring up as an example of something that i hate doing and i will procrastinate on forever hate calling people so uh, let's start with that. Why do you think you hate calling someone? Well, bec because it's another vague thing. I, I know that uh, most of the population does not have trouble with this at all. I don't know. Um, Every time I bring this up, usually people are people go, oh, yeah, me too. I hate calling people. Well, not everyone, okay. but people like me and you probably. Uh, I didn't realize that, but... I think it's more me, common than it sounds. It's so unknown. I'm calling someone. I think that they're going to answer. I don't know what the correct thing to say is. I mean, even if it's just ordering a pizza, mm -hmm. I don't know how to start that conversation. <laughs> I think when I'm doing it in, per in person, it's a much more, I can kind of read their, their body language or get their eye contact or something. But on the phone, I just, I got nothing. They say hello. And right. then I got, I don't know. I just, it, it's so vague. And I'm really afraid of that. Or, or I'm able to fill in all of that blank information with my imagination and it mm -hmm. becomes much scarier. You know, it's like the monster in the dark forest. Like you can see the eyes and you just imagine the rest. <laughs> yeah. And it can be yeah. monstrously huge. Yeah. But I, I think that might be why I'm afraid of phone calls. No, the, the vagueness I think is exactly right. I've been thinking about that all week. Uh, that that very particular feeling of unknowable weirdness i so i i call it my uh multiverse theory of embarrassing things that i could do at a party theory okay say that one more time <laughs> the multiverse theory of embarrassing things you could do at a party so okay. i uh used to have terrible social anxiety i still do but i used to too and <laughs> i would say it used to be debilitating and now it's just bad so it actually has been progress um but what would scare me the rare occasions that i did get invited to a party uh the problem is that i would get invited to this party and i would start to think about it and I would begin to picture all of the different things that I could do that would be awful and ruin my reputation. Not that I had any, but, you know, embarrass me somehow at this party. I would picture myself burning the house down or pushing somebody's baby into the pool on accident or spilling. Yeah, you know, this is <laughs> this is an anxiety. It's, stuff. Yeah. yeah, my brain's creative. Uh, I'd picture me being walked in on in the bathroom and then also me walking in on someone else in the bathroom and saying something stupid and insensitive to someone i i would picture every possible scenario of something terrible happening that i could but what was and, and i would basically 
add all of those things up into this gigantic black ball of terror. And that was my anxiety about going to some social event. But what didn't make sense was that all of those things can't happen at the same time. I can't burn the house down and also ruin the dinner and also sit quietly in a corner and do nothing and also do the pool thing. I mean, they're just, I won't be there long enough to do every single terrible thing. They are mutually exclusive alternate realities. So the logical thing would be to just be afraid of maybe like one or two of them because that's the most that can really happen. And it's irrational fear anyway because I've never actually burned down a house and it's unlikely that I would do it in the hour or two that I'm at a party. So that really shouldn't even be there, but it is. But the point is, that's how my social anxiety worked, was to take multiple mutually exclusive things that can't actually happen at the same time and stick them all together. And when it comes to a task, which I think that my propensity for procrastinating is very related to my social anxiety and my obsession and my perfectionism and all of those things, they're all very similar in certain ways. Uh, when I have a task that I want to avoid, subconsciously want to avoid, you know, procrastinate, oftentimes it's that. There's this anxiety about it where I'm imagining all of the random, difficult, different things that can happen, even though they can't all actually happen. You know, they, they are different parallel realities, like calling someone. I get anxious about that because I picture me waking them up from a sleep or they've just had an argument with their spouse or maybe they're happy to see me, but maybe they're not, or maybe they hate me. And there's just a million different things that go into the, the vagueness, like you said, of doing that thing. Can you give an example of something maybe recent, some kind of work related thing? or interest related thing where you have experienced this besides social anxiety <laughs> besides calling someone well i mean like like with software engineering or i can give you a really you, stupid example of like, this yeah, tiny little okay. thing okay so this week i knew we were talking about procrastination and i figured hey i know a procrastinator i'll just watch what he does and try to observe why he procrastinates when he does uh so I was in the basement doing something and I accidentally knocked over a bottle of hand sanitizer and it was a, it's from a local distillery. So it's ethanol based hand sanitizer. So it smells like alcohol. It smells really strong. Anyway, I knocked it over. Uh, it fell, hit the cap and the cap shattered. It's a plastic bottle. So the bottle didn't break and it kind of flopped on the floor and you know, half the, the contents of the bottle spilled it on the ground. And I'm like, oh crap. I just did that. So I picked it up, put it on a shelf, uh, and there's hand sanitizer on the floor. So I grabbed a towel, which was right there, and I wiped it up. It's like, eh, I did that. And I put the towel away, and I see the bottle on the shelf where I just put it. And I had this little thought of, I should put a cap on that because the cap broke, and it smells really strong, and it's going to make the basement smell like liquor. And then I walked away. <laughs> and then I thought to myself, I, I did it. I just procrastinated. Here we go. This is it's happening. I just did it. Why did I do that? I, I picked up the bottle. That wasn't a problem. I wiped up the stuff off the floor. Also not a problem. I put it on the shelf. Still not a problem. But then the, the thought of, oh, I should put a cap on that. And that's when I was like, nope, I'm out of here. Future me will take care of that. Present me is not interested anymore. Is it because you didn't know where a cap was and you would have to yeah. find one? Yes. And that that pursuit of finding a cap is vague and yeah. unclear. And so it could technically last forever. You don't know. So then you yes. just avoid it. Like I it, could I could spend the rest of my life trying to find a way to solve this problem that did not have a clear solution. Yes. That so I I froze. I realized I was procrastinating. I was thinking, oh my God, why did I procrastinate? What was it about that specific thing? And it is exactly that. I, I'm almost positive that we don't have another cap that will happen to fit, but digging through the recycling, trying to find one doesn't seem fun. And then I figured, well, I could cover it with saran wrap and a rubber band, right? But I don't know if we have saran wrap, so right. I might have to use maybe a sandwich bag. And then I, we probably have rubber bands, but where are they in the junk drawer? I could, you know, that come, came off of a broccoli 
thingy you know as is, are those even still good i would have to dig around i thought well maybe i could use tape but where is the tape right so it just keeps going yes there's this endless fog or vagueness in my head around that task and all of these different things feel unpleasant to me and i should mention that i did not you know in the movies when somebody's about to die and they have this flashback of their entire life playing out but really it's like half a second that yeah. was what that was i didn't think about any of that stuff and actually i think this is key of me not thinking about it i just had this feeling all these oh, i'm gonna have to dig through the recycling and the drawers and the tape and it won't be there and blah 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 like all this just kind of washes through my brain and i develop this aversion to wanting to deal with this bottle of hand sanitizer right and that's what happened when i stopped to think about it i realized okay maybe we i'm not going to look for a cap because we don't need to uh i don't think we have saran wrap so that's fine i just won't do that i could just use tape that's not a big deal i don't know where the tape is but really if i think about it i actually saw it recently i think i had it in the basement it's probably either on the desk where i was using it or i put it back in the bin where i usually stick stuff so really all i actually have to do to do that task is to walk over to the desk and i wasn't even that far from the desk check if the tape's there if it's not there go over to the bin and then put tape on it and so i did it and it wasn't a big deal so your solution to solving the problem was just slowing down and and clarifying like getting away getting rid of all the mist the smoke surrounding the, the i've been problem. calling it fog but i like that you okay, call it mist. Fog, sorry fog i was no, trying no, to get I, to the word that you said okay yeah fog i like to think of it as black fog um so this this week i wanted to observe myself procrastinating my goal wasn't to stop procrastinating it wasn't i actually was excited when i did it because i'm thinking oh we can use this on the podcast I, I did it we can figure out what's going on and the act of me observing myself just thinking through me at that moment procrastinating just observing it was enough to boil it down to oh all i actually have to do is this really simple thing i'll just go right. do that and then i just did it there the feeling of me wanting to avoid that was gone i had a similar experience but i think it was it was different i was i was <laughs> i caught myself procrastinating heavily heavily procrastinating tell me about you procrastinating i, I okay. want to hear someone well, else do it well i i thought of a couple different ways in which i procrastinate but this one uh, was today and i got kind of excited because i was like <laughs> oh, i'll just observe myself procrastinating yeah. and then it's okay but what happened was I've just, I've gotten a little less disciplined with my notifications on my phone and, and all that. And so I'm, I'm working and I keep checking my phone and I keep, keep going back. And what I realize is that I'm not really getting anything done. I keep, I keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm just not getting anywhere. It's like, I'm having to half solve the same problem over and over again so i was thinking about why is that like why why can't i just i don't know i think if i had stayed focused i would have been able to push through and keep working right so it the metaphor hit me it's kind of like a giant train focus is like a giant train it's this huge okay. machine that's just sitting there on the tracks it's just completely immobile and to get it moving, you have to start pushing it, right? <laughs> yeah. It's not a perfect metaphor. That's good. Use like your it. imagination. Yeah, you, yeah. you have to start pushing it. And you, you slowly get it going. And you, you keep pushing. It gets a little bit easier, a little bit easier. And then it starts to gain some momentum. And eventually, you hop on the focus train. And it carries you, right? And you stay focused. <laughs> yeah, and everything's yeah, yeah, going great. But what was happening was I would start pushing the train. <laughs> And then I'd stop and check my phone and the train would stop. And then I'd go to push it again 
and I'd check my phone and the train would stop and it just <laughs> it never got anywhere like it just kept coming yeah. right back to the same place and I just I couldn't get it moving and it was very difficult every time it's not like I could just jump right back into being super focused and so me uh, procrastinating was really just me not being able to focus and eventually I, I just want to give up when that happens and mm -hmm. that's happened uh, to me not just with the phone but with a lot of things if I keep getting distracted and a lot of times I'll distract myself mm -hmm. um, with things and then the the focus just doesn't happen and then I just give up that whether or not that's a perfect metaphor I don't know but I really like it because that feels pretty spot on with what my days can feel like sometimes I have some project whether it's work or personal whatever and that's exactly what it feels like where I, I try to get going and then I switch to something else. It could be my phone, but sometimes it's stupid stuff. It, right. It, Today well, it was my phone, but other days, I mean, it, it could be a lot of other, other yeah. things. Well, what do you, was there anything in particular about that task that made you in that state of mind? Do you think it was just something that is just how you were today, you know, the way you woke up or? I wasn't super interested in it. Um, and okay. so the, the phone was more interesting than mm. the task. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's probably what it was, but if I had stayed with the task, it would have become more interesting. Yeah. The fact that I kept doing the same thing over and over again, that was, that was stressful. okay. But, but one other thing, and, and this is almost like a different way of procrastinating, but if you think of focus as being like this super heavy thing that you have to start pushing, mm -hmm. um, it, other days I will think of me working in that way where if, if I sit down and start working, I'm going to have to push really, really hard to get this moving. Um, and so I will avoid that because I'm afraid of the massive amount of effort it will take at the beginning. Yeah. Um, and so I avoid that first push, that first contact with the work um i just i'm too afraid to deal with that heaviness of it yes um but when i finally sit down to start doing it if i if i follow through with it it eventually gets going i have a couple thoughts on that and i'll try to make sure i remember all the things i want to say first uh i think the you talked about how the the heaviness of the train right how yeah. you can almost have a resistance to that because you know that it's going to take a lot of effort i've been thinking a lot about the relationship between procrastination and obsession and perfectionism because i think those tend to bleed together a little bit in fact i was reading a bunch of different articles from you know psychology publications and things talking about uh, procrastination and one of the first things that almost all of them mentioned right away was that perfectionism is a risk factor for procrastination which rings very true for me uh but i was kind of surprised to see that that is widely acknowledged as a major part of it and I, I feel like well i feel like procrastination is a symptom of yes. perfectionism often. yes yeah, I think so. I, I, Well, let's say this. I think that everyone procrastinates some. Some people may not really relate to what we're saying too much, though. Some people procrastinate a little. You know, of course, you have something you need to do and you don't want to, and so you decide to do something else. That's fine. To put it in context, I would say that my procrastination, it has been a problem forever, ever since I can remember. Uh, mostly i think due to my own personality traits of that obsessiveness and perfectionism and so on uh, but it's never gotten completely out of control it has affected my life it has been very damaging to me in certain ways but for some people it is utterly debilitating there are people who cannot function they cannot work they cannot serve as a normal functioning human being because of the procrastination i i we uh, both listened to a podcast from Dr. Ferrari. Was that his name? Yes. Yeah, Dr. Ferrari. Yeah. Uh, uh, on, on the podcast called 
ologies. Yes, which was awesome. Really enjoyed yes. it. And just listening to Dr. Ferrari talk is a bit of a trip. Yeah. Uh, he's fun to listen to. Uh, but that was one of the main things that he was was talking about. Uh, the it, it was, he called it chronic procrastinators, right? Chronic procrastination, yeah. Yeah, kind of treating it as a, a very severe, serious problem for some subset of the population, uh, and how it's it's a huge problem that we don't think of it as a problem. Back to what I was saying right at the beginning. Oftentimes we just think of procrastination like it's a form of laziness. Oh, you're you're being lazy. Don't be lazy. Yeah, and uh, it's also kind of a joke. Like, oh, I'm just procrastinating. Right, uh, which is fine. Yeah. Some, you know, some people they are procrastinating. We all do it. It's, it is funny, but for some of us, I I do think it is a spectrum from minor to utterly life destroying. It can be on the more severe end of that spectrum. It can be a extremely serious problem for some people. I mean, it prevented Steven from getting his powder coating business open, which in the grand scheme probably was fine. He wound up in a good place, but it, it destroyed that avenue for him and it has destroyed many things for me. Uh, so it is a, a very serious problem. I forget what made me start talking about that. Dr. Ferrari. Yeah. Um, maybe that's it. <laughs> okay, maybe so. Uh, well, okay, for me, I have pretty bad procrastination and it is related to perfectionism uh, and obsession. There's a, a major correlation there. And I, I have a theory on that. And I think what it is, is that we even talked about this a little bit before. I, when I, when I start on any task or project, it tends to spiral into this all consuming, mind altering, can't sleep every, I'm, you know, fully focused and 110% engaged, uh, running an overdrive, thinking about and obsessing over this problem. Uh, and even for minor things where it doesn't quite get to that level, I'm still a perfectionist. I still tend to push it to the limits and try to do every little thing. Like something as simple as cleaning the bathroom. If I go to clean the bathroom, I don't just do a wipe down and scrub the toilet and be done. I'm on my knees scrubbing grout and like trying to get every last little bit of dirt and clean every little tile in the shower and it winds up taking forever and it does wind up really clean which is great but it makes me dread the task of cleaning the bathroom because for me because of the way i think it's a huge deal i think the same task for different people can wind up being so much more difficult if you have those personality traits of being obsessive and, and a perfectionist I mean, does that, is that how that, that sounds to you of uh, the weight of the train, I guess? Yeah. Okay. Well, absolutely. Some tasks, well, even just day to day. I mean, if I do a drawing one day and it's hard, the next day I go back to it, I know that it's hard. Right. So I tend to avoid it the next day. Or, right. Um, but I will say... When I, when I was writing music, and this was years ago, I spent my whole life focused on one aspect of music, and that was just writing music. And I knew that in order to continue writing music, I had to start learning more. I mean, I, I learned up to a point, but then I just kind of stopped, and I started putting it off because of how hard yes. it was for me. And so I, I procrastinated on that indefinitely still haven't really gone back to to <laughs> yeah. fully learning that and so i was i just kept focusing on the writing and that eventually just kind of ruined myself with music mm -hmm. but then i switched to art and i i found a more clear path of learning and when i did that i stopped procrastinating because it and it was completely different than anything I had ever experienced, yeah. not procrastinating, not procrastinating. <laughs> uh, in yeah. school, I didn't do great. I mean, I was a BC student. I never cared about school at all. Mm -hmm. It was all about my friends. But when I got to learning art, I completely changed and I learned how to schedule things. I learned how to not procrastinate. I, I learned how to learn and it was totally new to me. So I believe that a lot of people who have never really experienced 
the experience of not procrastinating, of being able to focus for long periods of time. Yeah. I think it's possible to change because I did. Yeah. Um, in a very big way. So you, I, and when specifically, we talk about, you, again. specifically you, you're saying you changed when you went from working on music to pursuing a career in art. That was the, but I, I don't think the subject matter matters. It was the, the clear path forward when I yeah. had a clear path, uh, figured out. Yeah. Um, I was able to focus for long periods of time, which I had never really been able to do before. I had always worked hard, but I, I never, I don't know. It was just totally different. And I believe that even people that may consider themselves chronic procrastinators or who have a serious problem with it can actually totally change if they change their, their approach mm -hmm. to the, to learning or to whatever they're trying to not procrastinate on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe we start shifting into talking about what you do about it. Uh, I, I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, yeah. I don't know that I had a real clear distinction between being a bad procrastinator and not. Uh, it's improved for me. I've, I've been able to function pretty well. I, I work from home. I tend to not have very strict deadlines most of the time so uh that's a if you are a procrastinator that's a rough environment to be in so i have had to deal with my own procrastination or i won't have a job i mean it's it's vital to right. me surviving for me to deal with that and i have done relatively well considering it's still a struggle uh for someone who as <laughs> It depends on your environment. I think some people wind up in a job where it it mostly puts them in a position where procrastination isn't a major factor. For others, you wind up somewhere where it is a constant battle. But I think the way to look at dealing with procrastination is to almost see it as if... I, I think it is a problem that you deal with for your whole life. It is not... There is no simple solution to it. There is no magic pill. There is no one trick of, oh, just make a to-do list and then you won't procrastinate. No, that doesn't work. If it did work, then we wouldn't even call procrastination a problem anymore. We would just say, oh, you're not making a to-do list, then make a to-do list, right? We we do not treat or think of the problem seriously enough and recognize how big of a deal it is for some people and how, in particular, I think people like me and maybe you too, uh, with certain personality traits have a real serious problem with procrastination. I think we need to think of it like there are going to be a lot of things that you can try to do to help with it and they all may help a little. And if you do all of them and you do it consistently, you can move the needle over time and become better as you go dealing with a problem that you're always going to have. Yes. Right. I, yeah. I, I think, one of the key ways to getting over procrastinating so much is knowing that there are so many different things that cause it. Yeah. Um, and you may just be dealing with one of them. Like maybe you just don't stay focused long enough. Maybe you give up too soon where if, if you focus twice as long, you'd be able to get through it. I mean, there's so yeah. many simple things that it could be that you could get rid of. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think identifying all of the ways that it's caused could lead to you yeah. Here's, being able to weed them out. Yeah. Here's how I've been thinking about that a little bit. Um, to me, when I procrastinate something... Oh, here, here's another example of something I actually did this week of procrastinating. When I was a teenager, I got braces, and then I got them off, and I got a retainer. Uh, and I'm supposed to wear this retainer every night, and I've had it since a child or a teenager. It's like glow in the dark because I thought that was cool at the time. Still glows in the dark. <laughs> um, and if I don't wear it, my teeth will uh, start exploring their environment. They, <laughs> they move, okay? Uh, and if I, if I put it on, eventually they will kind of move back to where the orthodontist decided they ought to be. 
And what I will do is I will go for it literally years of just not wearing this thing. And over time, my teeth start to spread apart and move around and it kind of, you know, progresses to not being good. And every night I brush my teeth, I look in the cabinet, I see the retainer glowing brightly, and I have a decision in front of me of, do I put this in tonight or do I let future me do it? Or do I do it tomorrow night? And it's interesting because the the decision is never between do I wear my retainer or do I not? Do I just let my teeth do whatever they want to do and it gets uncomfortable and whatever? I mean, that my teeth were really messed up when I was a teenager. That's not the decision. The decision isn't between do it or don't do it. The decision is always do it or do it later. And the do it decision, the reason I always avoid it is because if I haven't worn it in a while, it's kind of annoying. I put it in... And then I go to bed and sometimes I wake up in the night and like my teeth kind of ache because I haven't worn it in a long time and they're kind of being pushed on. And a lot of the time, maybe I'll take it out. Maybe I'll wake up and go, ah, oh, well, I got to leave it in because I got to make up for these two years of not having worn it and I got to get my teeth back. And so I wind up not sleeping well that night and whatever. That's the, the foggy grossness of me putting it in is I don't really know what's going to happen tonight and whatever. But the alternative decision is just, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. I, future me will take care of it. And future me, for some strange reason, is this dissociated, weird version of myself that feels very detached from me, but at the same time, he's like the best version of me, where for some reason it won't bother him at all tomorrow night, and he'll just do it and it'll be fine. Uh, but the decision is always between something kind of gross or something completely frictionless. Like just the do it later, not a big deal. And I think that's pretty key in the way procrastination works because if the decision was black or white of you either put this thing in or you never do it again and you have to experience the consequences of never wearing your retainer and your teeth being messed up, then that would force me to decide, okay, which of these two alternatives do I actually want? There's consequences either way, I'll probably go with putting it in. But the procrastination part is this perfect, wonderful, relieving idea of, oh, I'll have all the benefits of still wearing the retainer, I just do it tomorrow. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I hadn't really thought about it like that, yeah. where it's actually pleasurable to yes. put it off because you can actually sort of fantasize or see yourself taking care of it in the future. It's, so it's, that, that is interesting. I always view the, the decision as do it or don't do it. Right. But to think of it as do it or do it later, the do it later becomes a little more attractive. Yeah, I think that's why deadlines are so important. I made it through school, through high school, through college, and I did pretty well being a severe procrastinator i would do things at the last possible instant because if i had a, a big assignment due some book report or something if it was due on friday and it's monday the choice is between do it now or do it later which again is this wonderful frictionless excellent choice that has all the benefits of both because i don't have to deal with it now but future me does it so it still gets done that's the choice on monday night but on thursday night or Friday morning on the bus ride to school, the choice is I either do it or I don't do it. And if I don't do it, I have to pay the consequences. So the choice becomes extremely different when you have a hard deadline in front of you. Then you actually are choosing between these two polar opposites of having done it or having not. But the procrastinating, it's never that. It's always this wonderful choice of, I'll just do it later. Future me will do it. I think what deadlines give you is a sense of urgency yeah they do well then and they think, give you a choice yeah they make they, you make a choice yeah they they force you to do it that sense of urgency forces you to make decisions yeah. right away and i think that is absolutely key to being productive uh, period um a it, sense of urgency a sense of urgency when i do a painting if the if the time frame is indefinite mm -hmm. it just 
it never happens or I end up spending way too much time on one area worrying about tiny little details that don't matter and then I'll have to redo it. it you know, it just it just becomes this big mess. But when there's a sense of urgency, you're forced to only think about the most essential, most important parts of it and and wrap it up quickly. Right. Right. And 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 so it it pushes you to make the best decisions very quickly. I mean, you don't want to be in a panic state, but <laughs> having that that looming deadline, having that that mm -hmm. that concrete time frame that something needs to be completed, is the secret to completing things. I I think. Yeah, I. Th um, so I I think you're very right, and there's one other aspect of it I wanted to talk about. I have noticed in myself that when I procrastinate, for some reason, I don't really think of myself. If, if I have a day where I'm procrastinating all day, I have a bunch of stuff to do and I'm just not doing it. The weight of that choice doesn't tend to hit me. I, I, I don't necessarily have this feeling of, oh my God, I have all this stuff to do and I'm not doing it and now I'm behind and I have made a bad choice today. I have this feeling of, oh, I put off a bunch of stuff today, but it's fine because it's only Tuesday. And on Thursday, I'm sure I'll be super focused and productive and I'll get everything done. There's this weird form of optimism that shows up for me when I'm procrastinating, where the, the future me in my head is this best possible version of me that is hyper-focused and never in a bad mood and never tired and just always able to handle anything. And it reminds me a lot of one of the issues I have with perfectionism. I, I think I gave this example on the previous show, but I was talking about how I played tennis in high school. And there was a few days for whatever reason where I played super well, just played somebody way above my level and beat them played out of my mind, felt amazing. And from that point on, that was my picture of myself. I'm that player. And every time I played tennis and I didn't perform that well, which is pretty much all the time, because that was me at my absolute best, I was disappointed and angry in myself. And that contributed to the perfectionism aspect of me. I find that happening in procrastination where that same sort of weird optimism of me at my absolute best, that's how I picture future me. It's always the best possible version of me. I remember one time four years ago, I stayed up all night and did a paper and got it done and it was great. And from that point on, that's always my own internal mental image of future me. It's the best possible version. And that weird optimism, and I, I tried to find a name for it and I couldn't. I read all different articles and things and they always just called it optimism. So I don't know if it has a specific name. Uh, I call it delusional self-optimism. Well, we identify, we have an identity. We see ourselves a yes. certain way. And I think we're kind of nice to ourselves in that way where we, we pick and choose the things we like and don't like about us. And yeah. so we're going to choose the thing or the one day that we were amazing and apply that to our identity. <laughs> Which I think that is natural. Yeah. But it's weird how it shows up in procrastination for me, where I'm right. always faced with this choice of do I do this thing now where I don't really feel that good and there's all these reasons why I don't want to do it or hand it off to superhero ultra productive version of future me that is going to show up on Thursday. Right. And I, what you were saying about the urgency that you should feel. I think part of the problem with procrastination for me is that it I don't feel it. I oftentimes have this weird idea that you know the thursday mic is going to be amazing is going to you know make up for all the failings of tuesday mic and i don't know right. why but i should feel i should have done a fifth of the work i have to do on tuesday and i didn't so i'm gonna feel just as weird about it on wednesday but i'm gonna have double the work to do and that's a big problem the urgency doesn't show up like it should well is is there a deadline for what you're thinking of? I mean, is, is this is this a self-imposed project or is this given to you from an employer? I, it can be both. I think it... Uh, 
for an employer project or some project that I, I know I have to get done, um, this can happen on a, a say a week time scale where I, I wind up not doing good work in the start of the week and then piling on a lot later in the week, which isn't great. Uh, for a personal project, sometimes the procrastination just shows up as indefinite deferment where right. it's always going to be future me that does it and surely future me is going to feel amazing even though i never happen to feel amazing and maybe i did now and then but it doesn't happen that often and you know that's i guess that's the difference there i've noticed i've noticed a complete black and white difference between things i've given at work and things i do by myself at home both have deadlines one is immovable and the mm -hmm. other is movable <laughs> yeah uh, when when i get a new project at work and it, it has to be something that i'm pretty excited about but when i get it i immediately start thinking about it and start working on it i mm -hmm. mean it's just it's instant like as soon as i get off the phone or as soon as it's given to me i'm out of the meeting it's like i'm on the computer i'm researching i'm I'm getting started like right. if I'm excited about it I mean I will start right away and there is no there is no procrastination there is no trying to talk myself into it nothing if it's at home and it's my own thing I just kind of I think about it and I dream about it being amazing and I'm just like oh well I'm not ready today to mm -hmm. do my best work tomorrow will be the best me that will work on it and then tomorrow comes and same thing. And I keep putting it off because I want it to be amazing. And who I am that day mm -hmm. is not amazing. So I, I keep putting it right. off. So, but, it, so you do have a bit of that optimistic future you oh, perception. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. But I think the difference with work stuff or, or stuff that has a definite deadline, it's also that it's it's not just the deadline. It's the fact that the the problem is perfectly laid out in front of me the requirements are all listed you know it has mm -hmm. to be this size it's got to be it's got to include this this and this um it needs to be due next week you know there, there's all these different requirements that go into it and so the the problem is very clear it's not perfectly clear but it's right it, it's pretty clear when it's my own personal stuff it can be pretty vague very vague yeah and i keep making it more and more vague and the the quality level when I'm working on personal stuff is it is it, it's just infinite. It could right. be, you know, my very best work. Whereas with work, the quality level is defined by the time frame that I have to do it in. Right. But, so I think that's why deadlines work differently for me. Yeah. And that's but that. Yes. But, sorry. The uh, the optimism that plays into what I'm doing at home is absolutely real because I, I imagine it being this magical, wonderful thing in the future, you know? Yeah, I, I didn't think as much about that particular part of it, but I think you're right. When you are doing a personal project, oftentimes the you almost fantasize about how amazing it'll be and it, yeah. it kind of grows to this massive scale of you picturing this the best thing you've done in your life. And then you procrastinate, so you never do it. Yeah. I mean, I have lots of projects that are uh, in the air still. Yeah. And in my head, in the future, they're going to be so good. Right. Um, but currently, I'm not even working on them. So. Yep. Yeah. It, I think that's what a lot of people deal with, is they, mm -hmm. they imagine themselves as this amazing whatever it is, you know, if they're in music, they're this super famous uh, musician or they're just this amazing music yeah. teacher or, or whatever it is, they're doing it really well. And, but the problem is, is that they can't, yeah. they can't break that down and they can't put it into a daily thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, you said, I think that's the perfectionism affecting your, it, it turns something that might be a relatively straightforward task for someone else into something gigantic and as you said vague and weird and not concrete just this blobby mess in your mind of 
amazing things that you're going to do, but you don't know how, and it's, it's extremely not concrete. Uh, but the, the reason why I think that applies to procrastination or, or why people procrastinate with things is because they only want to work on the thing when they are their perfect selves. Yeah. And they don't feel like them, their perfect selves that day. So let's push it off till tomorrow when I will be perfect yeah. or the next day. Yeah, to me, your your relationship in your mind with that future you is very critical uh, in terms of how you how you face a decision any given day of do I work on this or do I not? Um, that's the well, I, I think there's if we're talking about solutions and how you deal with it or how I try to deal with it there. I think there's two sides to it. There's the deal with the problem itself part where you can do certain things to try and make the problem less gross and vague and foggy and hard to deal with. Uh, and then there's also things that you can do about that second choice of, oh, I'll do it later. Future me will do it. I think, well, like with the hand sanitizer thing, I wasn't trying to make myself not procrastinate this week. I was trying to just observe it. And much like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, when you observe something, it affects it. Uh, and honestly, I did not procrastinate much this week. I wore my retainer every night for the first time in probably two years. And I did not intend to. Like I said, that was not my plan to not procrastinate. I just wanted to observe. But making those observations made me have to think more about really both sides of the equation. One was the future me part of why am I thinking that tomorrow I'm going to want to wear this retainer? Why do I think that four hours from now, I'm suddenly going to be hit with this desire to go take care of this hand sanitizer bottle. There's no reason to think that future me is going to be any different than present me. So that's a false choice. J just making the observation about that made me have to think about that fact. And it started to change my weirdly optimistic view of future me. So that to me was key. The other thing was that fogginess, the, the weird grossness of the task, just observing it made it sort of go away. You know, the that feeling of, oh, I'm going to have to root through the recycle bin in the rain to find a cap. No, I won't. I just need to decide I'm not going to do that. I'm going to find some tape. And actually, I think I know where the tape is, so it's not that big of a deal. And I just did it. And all that weird fogginess went away. Uh, so number one for me, if we're talking about ways to deal with it, is just begin observing and start recognizing when you do that, when you start that future me trade-off thing. If you just make that observation, I think it changes a lot. It can make yeah. it so much more straightforward of a choice. It flips the balance a little bit between this gross thing you have to do now and this perfectly wonderful thing of you just passing it off. Yeah, I think the, the more light you can shed on that dark, scary yeah. thing, the less scary it, it becomes. Yeah. Um, and you had said before that um, another time, I don't remember, um, it, when we look at a problem or when we think of a problem in the future, we just kind of see every single problem at the same time. Right. The multiverse really, theory. Yeah. 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 The multiverse theory. Um, and it, that's really scary when you look at every possible uh, right. outcome. But when you sit down to do it, it's really just one thing at a time and it's really not that bad. Yeah, I think that's the difference between consciously thinking through something and making real rational thoughts about, okay, if I start my taxes, how bad will it be? Uh, versus just letting your mind kind of churn and collect all the possible anxieties without really even thinking through them and formulating this feeling in your head of, of this task. Uh, so conscious thought versus uncontrolled, letting your mind run wild, wild thought, I think is a really big part of changing the way you feel about doing a task. You, know, you collapse the multiverse into a single universe of realistically, there's not that many messed up things that can happen when I do it. Right. And really the only way to get to that realization is to start doing it is to experience the the fact that those things don't happen well i would know? say i would say this i mean yes i do agree and i what you said about the train really sits well with me that 
once you get once you get moving to me it's as if you have collapsed the multiverse and now you have your one thing where you you start to see what's in front of you and you have a little bit of this almost confidence of having completed part of it and you go oh I, i've started it's not that bad I, I don't have to deal with all these million different things there's really just a few and that's when the train starts moving uh but i i do think for some people it can feel virtually impossible to start and the two solutions that I hear people put forward are uh, time management solutions, which are irrelevant. You know, people don't procrastinate because they can't figure out how to manage their time. You know, they don't need a calendar. They need a way of feeling better about the thing they're doing. Um, so people will, will say that, you know, time management. There's, a, there's an asterisk there. I think that time management solutions can wind up being helpful, but not because they're managing your time. Uh, and then let's go back to that what was the okay. other the other one is uh use your willpower like just get over it just do it right. and i don't think that's necessarily bad sometimes it is okay to just push yourself a little bit but just using raw willpower to overcome doing something clearly procrastinators have tried that and it is still a problem so that can't be the answer because it doesn't work uh, also, right. that's just a finite resource. I think you know you run out of stamina. You can't just force yourself into everything. I don't think that's the right way to think about it. I think the way you want to think about it is kind of what we were saying. First, just make the observations. And really, your goal is to take a task that feels really ugly and messy and foggy and try to turn it into something clearer and simpler. That's the way you should be trying to approach the problem. If you make the task easier, not force yourself to do something that's really hard. No, ab absolutely. You should make it easier. Yeah. I, I think that is, that's the secret to a lot of things is just mm -hmm. find a way to make it easier for you, not harder. The The secret to achieving big things is not yeah, making the working little super hard. It's making it easy for you so you can work really hard um, or so you want to work really hard. I have found that and this is along the lines of making things easier is that it, it's like my one hack to overcoming uh, pr uh procrastination and yeah. that is as soon as you wake up go immediately to whatever it is you want to work on or you need to be working on skip the coffee skip the breakfast skip the everything and okay. go straight to it i don't know if i'm on board but go ahead well i don't do this every day but it, it works every time for me. You go straight to the thing. Say you want to be a piano player, but you always procrastinate. Wake up in the morning, skip everything, and immediately go and start playing the piano. Don't think about it. Just do it. Whenever I do this kind of thing, and it, it's just you, you go straight for it, it's, it becomes the one thing you think about for the entire day. Mm. If you don't do it, if you make your coffee, eat your breakfast, you want to have a nice relaxing morning. So you, you take your time and you open your phone and you flip through some stuff, you read some news, you watch some TV, you just want to relax and have a great time. Well, eventually what happens is you, you keep putting it off and you just feel comfortable. You, you don't mm -hmm. want to change anything. Then you start feeling like a failure, <laughs> at le least for me. I start feeling like a failure. And a failure doesn't get things done, right? <laughs> Agreed, yeah, yeah, yeah. A failure doesn't do anything, but but that's how I feel. Like, I, I mm -hmm. feel like a failure. So I don't really feel like being successful. I don't feel like getting things done. And so it just keeps going and going, and I keep putting it off. Mm -hmm. And I wish that I was all productive, but I'm not. So it, that tiny little decision in the morning of, do I go straight to the thing that's my highest priority, or do I work around it yeah. and get to it eventually? Um, I don't know. That that has made such a big difference w when I do it. Um, I don't think it is sustainable. Like you can't always do that. Yeah. You need to eat your breakfast and you need to, <laughs> you know, sometimes exercise yeah. beforehand or whatever. But if you're having a big, a, a, a lot of trouble with getting started, try mm. it. Um, it. It has worked for me. I, I like the idea. Um, I was going to say what one of my major prescriptions for 
doing that kind of thing, like being able to get into something that you're procrastinating on, or you get stuck in that mode where you can't ever get the train moving. Um, I think part of what, a big part of what makes it so hard is that complexity, the, the bigness of the task. Uh, and so it, it feels like when you start, you're having to throw yourself into dealing with this massive thing. Uh, and it can make starting something really difficult. Uh, I think your goal is to take that massive thing. One, sometimes the first task in doing something is to literally just think about it. Uh, you know, if it's this big, here's an example. Say somebody wants to learn programming, right? They have it written on their to-do list of learn to program. But anytime they start thinking about learning to program, you're like, God, I don't, when do I start learning to program? What is, what do I do? What does that even mean? Uh, so I think the, the way you could turn that task into a startable thing is to say, okay, uh, number one for this task of learning to program, I need to just figure out what programming language I want to learn. Just maybe the first goal, the first brick in the house this is a wait but why metaphor which i like is that don't think about the house think about a brick maybe the first brick in learning to program is task number one i'm going to google what are the different programming languages or maybe google which programming language should i learn and read a couple articles on the different ones and listen to people argue which one i ought to learn it doesn't even have to be choose one just google it just yeah find the ones that you're gonna choose from yeah like that can be the first part of the task part of what makes that idea of learning a program so gross and hard to deal with is that there actually are all these little decisions and tasks that have to be done on your way of i need to figure out what it even means to learn to program how do you make a program what i've heard people say compile what is that what do i do i need a program to do that how does that work do I need to learn how to use a command line? What are different programming languages? All that stuff is actual stuff that you need to think about and decide on. But you, it's kind of baked into this idea that and you haven't really treated it as if, yes, deciding on a programming language, that's a task that I have to do. Typing it into Google and reading about it, that's a task that I have to do. Figuring out what I need to install, that's another task that I have to do. If you turn it into very concrete, simple things like that, and sometimes you don't even know what they are, but the first step is just figure out what I need to figure out, that's an actionable thing that you can go do, and you can put that on your list and say, okay, I'm going to start today with typing these words into Google and reading the first few results. That's my task for today. And that is how you start something. You know what I think is interesting is that people, the fact that they want to look up how to be a programmer in the first place is that they find the idea appealing. Mm -hmm. They like it, like they're interested in this. And right. then all of a sudden it, it turns into this life plan or this, this thing mm -hmm. that they have to do. And that's when they get tripped up. <laughs> yeah that's when it becomes like this job and this heavy burden. Whereas if they just stuck with the fact that they were interested in it to begin with, it would probably pull them mm -hmm. all the way through and I, keep going. But it, it's like, it, it becomes something else. Yes. It starts as an interest. It becomes a, a task that they don't want to do anymore. I think it's that obsessive perfectionist type nature. It's, yeah. it's, I, I know this for myself. It's hard to think of doing almost anything without immediately picturing me dedicating my entire life to being the absolute <laughs> best at it. Yeah. That's just how my mind works. And it makes me not do things because they, they aren't just these simple, oh, I want to try this. Like, no, I have to spend decades trying to perfect it and being the best. That's just, that's just what happens to me. And it's irrational. It's, it's irrational. It, it actually makes me not the best at anything because I keep doing this with all these different things. Why, why is that? I don't know, but I think it might just boil down to one of those very fundamental personality traits. You know, the perfectionism, the uh, weird optimism, that kind of stuff. I, it might well, just be how we're wired, some of us. 
I don't know. I mean, you, you find something you're interested in and you start playing with it and mm -hmm. I don't know, you start discovering things in that world. And then all of a sudden you apply that to your identity. And when you, when you do that, yeah. you start seeing yourself in the future. And when you do that, you start imagining that person in the future as being totally amazing and perfect. And, and you start relating that to other people that are so mm -hmm. amazing and perfect at that thing. And then it becomes something that you have to achieve. You know? Yeah. Future you shows up again in that yeah. situation. Yeah. Why do we do that? I don't, I don't think everyone does that. I, I think that's a, a unique trait for some people. Like I talked about, I definitely do that. yeah, yeah. Well, that's why we're here talking about procrastination <laughs> because we do it. Uh, like I said before with the, you know, if you, if you gave a bunch of kids a paper and said, draw a house, some of them are going to agonize over it. And some of them are just going to phone it in and not care about it. Uh, I think that there's, I don't want to talk about the kids who phone it in and don't worry about it because they have things going on that aren't going on with me. And so their situation is very different. And I, I think it's similar to this. Not everybody's a procrastinator. Not everybody's a perfectionist. Uh, and for them, the problems they face are different. Right? They, right. they may not need to do this kind of thing with thinking about a task, fantasizing about future you. Uh, but for us, I think that's how it works. Hey guys, so Daniel and I wound up talking for over two hours on procrastination. Uh, who would have thought? So we decided to release the first half, which is what you just heard. And then next week you can hear the second half. Uh, so thanks for listening. Uh, if you want to leave us a review or leave us some feedback on YouTube, that would be amazing. We have loved reading everything you guys have written. It was stunning to see so many uh, fantastic responses to, uh, to the show. So thanks for listening. See you next week.